please pray with me. Dear Lord, we're thankful for your love and for your mercy, which has changed our own lives from the, uh, from the sinful lives that we had where we walked away from you. It's nice to know that you're always wanting us back. Father, we're thankful for the, the gift of your son. We're thankful that he willingly gave his life on our behalf to bring us home. Father, help us to bring honor to his name in the lives that we lead, the way that we see things, the way that we act. Father, help us to be a light to this world. You can sure use it right now. Father, we ask for your safety from the virus. It's everywhere, and it can't even be avoided. Father, we ask that we uh, learn to live with that, whether it's a vaccine that comes through or we just learn better ways to, to get by. Father, we ask for the safety of those who catch it who uh, get very, very sick. We ask for your help with the hospitals and with the uh, medical teams to take care of them. Father, we also ask that you uh, be with this great nation with the unrest that we have. We have unrest that comes from just staying home. We have unrest that's built up over years. We have unrest with an election, with racial matters. Father, we have unrest due to economic status. Father, please heal that. Help us to live with love the way you designed us. Father, right now what's on our mind is a tropical storm or a hurricane that's on its way here. Father, many of us have been through many of these. We ask that you please keep us safe. Keep our, keep our homes safe. We know that sometimes there's trees and there's stuff that blows around. That's just part of the deal. Help us clean up afterwards. Like I said, keep us safe. That's what we really uh, are looking for. Father, we ask for your healing hand on Calvin Nobles. Calvin was at Advent Health with an irregular heartbeat. We ask that you bless him with the uh, right medicine and whatever to, to get his health get his heart beating correctly again please be with Marie Holloway after her fall we know how how much that hurts and it's not easy to sit or stand or anything else Father please be with her to heal her please be with the friend of the raps Cody he's had COVID-19 for a while he's got severe lung damage we know he's young we know he's missed by his friends please be with the friend of Angel Harvey, who's been on a ventilator for the last three weeks, too. Father, we know these are times where it's the only help that we can get comes from you. Father, be with Gage Eggleston, a heart problem that he has. Please heal that. Please uh, heal that young guy. Um, a lot of people are dependent on him. Father, also be with Mitzi. Um, we ask the cancer treatments are successful. They can wipe out that cancer, and she can get on with the life that she leads. We know she does a great job as a principal. She's loved by her family. Father, we ask for your healing hand on Mitzi. Father, we ask that you bring us back together. Bring us together as a body. Help us to function. Help us to disciple. Help us to evangelize. Help us to reach out with benevolence. Help us to uh, build the church together in fellowship. We know that's how you designed us. Father, it's not easy right now with the uh, with the pandemic. Father, we ask that you bring us back together. Help us to find ways. The church building may be closed, but we know that the church is never closed. Father, we ask for your blessings. We ask for your forgiveness. As always, we ask for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, I would like to reflect a moment on Jesus' work as our mediator and our intercessor. The first recorded words of Jesus as he hung on the cross are found in Luke's account in chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Notice that this is a prayer to the Father. His first words are a prayer, not for himself, but for others. For those, in fact, who are murdering him unjustly. He's interceding between God the Father and sinful man. He was exemplifying what he had taught during his ministry. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. And love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There he was, suspended between heaven and earth, as the Hebrew writer says in chapter 10, opening a new and living way into the Holy of Holies by his body and his blood, interceding for the very worst of humanity. Was this prayer not for you and I as well? Although we weren't there to scourge or beat or curse or spit on him or crown him with thorns or hammer the nails in his hands and feet, it was for our sin he endured all this. If Jesus interceded this way for his tormentors, I have confidence that he intercedes for me when I sin. Again, the Hebrew writer tells us, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He is interceding for each one of us even now. Let us pray. Father, as we take this bread today, help us never to forget the enormity of what it represents, that your perfect son's body was maimed beyond recognition to open the way for us into your presence, and that he lives there today to continually intercede for us. Thank you for allowing it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the prayer, the fruit of the vine. Lord, we continue this weekly remembrance of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the continuous forgiveness of all our sins through the blood he shed there on the cross, which this fruit of the vine represents. And thank you that he was obedient in suffering unto death. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Today I'll be reading John 11, 1 through 3. There was a man named Lazarus who was sick. He lived in the town of Bethany where Mary and her sister Martha lived. Mary is the woman who later put perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Mary's brother was Lazarus, the man who is now sick. So Mary and Martha sent someone to tell Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Welcome to our worship service. We're having a hurricane right now, so we're doing this virtual. Hopefully by the time we get there, everything will have blown off and it'll be safe. I want to start with some comments by Philip Yancey from his book, Disappointment with God. He starts out writing these words. Ever since I wrote my book, Where is God When It Hurts? And it was published, I've received letters from people disappointed with God. A young mother wrote her joy in that she was pregnant. How the joy had turned to bitterness and grief when she delivered a daughter with spina, dip, uh, with spina bifida. Page after page recounted the expenses that she went through trying to make it easier for her child. But the medical bills kept packing up and finally her husband couldn't take the pressure and the marriage cracked. And he left. She wrote that she once believed in a loving God but she doesn't anymore. There are lots of examples that Yancey writes about. A woman who was suffering depression and day after day she wakes up and tries to find a reason to get out of bed and go to work. She does it because there's no other source of income for her. But when her shift is done, she goes home, she eats a little bit and she goes back to bed. Or the marriage of 30 years when they launched their final child, the husband made an announcement. The final child was leaving for college and he was leaving his wife or his secretary. As I read those, I, I started wondering, do I have any moments like that in my past? And I do. In 1988, Pan Am 103 was blown out of the skies in Lockerbie, Scotland. My wife's brother didn't like Pan Am. So he never flew Pan Am, and when Sue's mom heard it, she was always the alarmist of the family. She said, Harry was on that plane, and we argued, why would Harry be on a Pan Am plane? He hates Pan Am. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, we got the phone call that he was. And we drove straight through from northern Florida to West Virginia. Wondering why it had happened. And then there was Terry and Louise. Terry and Louise had been separated for six months. And they decided after six months of trying this themselves, they would go to a counselor. And somebody gave them my name. After almost nine months of counseling, they were back together and they were going to, to give it a go. It was almost two and a half years later that she called me and said, I just wanted to know how good you did. And I said, how, how good did I do? And she says, Terry and I are pregnant. When they had the baby, I went to the Cannonsburg Hospital. And they insisted that I hold the baby. 
I'm not good with babies. I think they break. They're that little thing that you hold in your hands. But they swore the baby smiled at me and liked me. And every once in a while, I would get a phone call that they were in the area of my office and they wanted to come just to show me their daughter. And I remember when they called me from Pittsburgh Hospital, the child's cancer ward. And I walked in and there was their little girl and she ran up to me and sat on my lap. Had a little bit of hair, but not much. And they'd call me to pray for her. And I did, but she didn't make it. And Terry and Louise, for a while, they they just blamed God for taking their little girl. They're back now at church and doing some good. They're ministering to people who lose children. And then a year ago, we had a young lady staying with us. And and she was doing so good. And we were so proud of all that she had done. But she died. She had a little boy now, and we've been watching him grow up. And we keep saying how much his mother would love to have seen this. Welcome to our new series. Faith versus doubt. A lot of times when we think of faith and doubt, we think they're in opposite corners. But they're not. Often they are two sides of the same coin. I'm going to be using some of Yancey's materials that we've mentioned already tonight, but my main source will be from John Ortberg's book, Faith and Doubt. And we're going to look at some times when we really have it hard and our faith suffers. It'll be good to know that there are people in the Bible and situations in the Bible where the faith suffered. There was a man named Lazarus and he was sick. And he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. They're speaking of Lazarus, who a lot of people outside the 12 disciples said, Lazarus is his best friend. To get there, he had to leave Bethany, wade through a a shallow part of the River Jordan and find Jesus preaching. But he did find him and he, he tells him the same thing that the sisters had sent him because they're worried about their brother. But when Jesus hears it, he he says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified. And don't miss this. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. He loved these people. They were family to him. And yet he tells his 12 
we're not going back there right now. I kind of feel like it might have been because his disciples don't want to go back to Bethany. But he says, finally, let's, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they say, a, a sure while ago the Jews tried to stone you. And yet you're going back there. And Jesus answers in something that almost sounds like a riddle. Aren't there 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble for he sees the world's light. Yet it is he who walks by night that stumbles for he has no light. After this he looks at them and he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. And his disciples says, Lord, if he's asleep, let him sleep. He'll get better. But Jesus was trying to tell them in a nice way that Lazarus had died. So he tells him plainly so they don't miss it. Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad that I wasn't there. So you may believe, but let's go to him. Now notice what Thomas says. Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. He gets back to Judea. He's not going to be raising Lazarus from the dead. They're not going to give him that chance. He's going to be dead before he arrives. In other words, Thomas doesn't believe he can accomplish what he set out to accomplish. They've got to go basically the reverse route of the men who had came to them. And they've got to cross the Jordan. And Jesus finally arrives just outside of Bethany. And he found that Lazarus has been dead and already in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany's just two miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come along and they were there for Mary and Martha and trying to comfort them at the loss of their brother. And Martha hears that Jesus is coming, that he's right outside the city, and she goes out to meet him, but Mary stays. Now notice her words. Lord, Martha says to Jesus, if you would have been there, My brother would not have died. Now let me give you my translation. Lord, if you had just gotten here, if you had just been here, you could have handled anything. Why would you let this happen? You could have stopped it. And I know even now, God will give you whatever you asked. And, and Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he'll rise again at, in the resurrection at the last day. Now this just shows that Martha has been heavily influenced by the teachers of her day, the Pharisees. And Jesus tells her, I know that's what you believe. But it's not the way it is. The way it is, is that I am the resurrection and the life. And, and he who believes me will live even though he dies. And, and whoever dies and believes in me, whoever lives and believes in me, excuse me, will never die. Do you believe this? That's a radical agenda change. If you believe me, there will be life always. 
And she hears this and she goes back to Mary. Mary gets up when she hears Jesus is there and quickly goes to him. Now Jesus has an energy He's just staying at the place where he had met with Martha. And Mary had been in the house and she gets up quickly and she goes, but the people who have come to Jerusalem to comfort her, they think she's going to the tomb. But she's running to Jesus. And when she gets to Jesus, she looks at him and she falls at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. Now, if I read between the lines right, she's saying, we sent people to you to tell you to come. And you're coming four days late? Why didn't you come when you first learned about it? Why not then? You could have stopped it. Don't you care? And when Jesus sees her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who have opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Where was he? Why did he let this happen? Why didn't he do something different? A Jesus who cares enough to cry because other people hurt is now being accosted because he has the power to stop it. And it didn't work out that way. So Jesus is moved and he comes to the tomb. It was a cave and he tells them to take away the stone but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been in there four days. Four days in that day and time, but in the hot desert, it caused a lot of, of odor when somebody was buried. She doesn't believe he's going to do it. She doesn't believe he can do what he just promised. So she's worried about the odor. And they start pulling back the, the rock. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looks up and says, Father, I thank you that I have, that you have heard me. Notice that's the past tense. Jesus has already been praying about this situation. I knew you would always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe you sent me. And then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man comes out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus says to them, take off the grave clothes and let them go. Faith, yeah, they had faith. They believed that Jesus could do it. That took a lot of faith. But doubt, yeah. I just got one point that I want you to remember. 
Faith is not the absence of doubt. But rather it is still believing in the midst of your doubt. You'll have times when you'll find it's two sides of the same coin. When you believe God could have done something, but he didn't. And you wonder why. This is especially important now because there are some of us who, who get sick and some of us who have lost close friends to COVID-19. I wonder why them, but I still believe God's in control. After all, he gave his son on a cross and never lost control. Thank you for listening. I hope you come back Wednesday night as we continue to look at this subject. Thanks again.
you bow with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Be with us as the pandemic continues to worsen in the United States. And be with us as the hurricane hits today. And continue to bless us and guide us. In your name, amen.